Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. The Wrestling Changed My Life podcast proudly presents Gable the Goat Part 2. My name is Ryan Warner. I directed and produced this episode. If you haven't listened to Part 1, stop what you're doing. Go back to episode 108, listen to that, and come join us for Gabe of the Goat, Part 2. This episode is brought to you by the Wrestling Changed My Life online store. Please text MERCHANDISE to 555-888 or go to store.wrestlingchangemylife.com. We have podcast t-shirts, hoodies, stickers, coffee mugs, all proceeds go to support this podcast as well as future documentaries we do. Again, text MERCHANDISE to 555-888 for the Wrestling Changed My Life online store. This episode is also brought to you by Audience Maven. That's audiencemaven.com. They are a podcast production company for small businesses and individuals who are looking to connect with their audiences. They helped a lot uh, during the production of this podcast in terms of being a soundboard for for different storylines and different creative ideas. I would highly recommend them. It's audiencemaven.com. That's it, folks. Let's get to the show. I think the first thing for me that made him one of the elite coaches of all time was uh, the fact that he was so incredibly trustworthy. Former Olympic hero Dan Gable certainly has some great Gable, you win an NCAA record today. You have five individual champions. Before that, it was four. What in the world is there left for you to do, Dan, at the age of 37? Gable, the gifted well, coach of the U.S. wrestling team. I first met him in 1972 when I covered wrestling in There aren't Italy. many people, Dan and uh, Dan's the only one in my lifetime that I've met, there aren't many people who can say they were the best in the world at what they did. Dan Gable can say that. If we're talking dynasties in college sports, the Dan Gable at Iowa Hawkeyes right near the very top. 15 national titles in 21 years and 21 consecutive Big Ten titles. But it wasn't always that way. And this story covers the years from 1987 through 1993 as we watch legendary coach Dan Gable rebuild the Iowa wrestling dynasty. This is how he did it. With five finals having been wrestled and only five yet to go, Iowa is really up against it, as you can see. March 1987, the NCAA Wrestling Championships. Dan Gable is the head coach of the Iowa wrestling team. They've won the last nine consecutive team championships and are going for their 10th. Dan Gable's going to have his hands full. He'll need a real miracle to pull this one out. No team in NCAA history has ever won 10 championships in a row. Not even the great John Wooden teams of the 70s. There's Coach Dan Gable watching, obviously knowing he needs every victory, every win from his wrestlers in order to maintain his quest for a 10th consecutive championship. But then something happened that would change the course of wrestling history forever. Iowa lost its first match. And with it, the team championship. As its first title since 1977, Dan Gable's nine-year streak with the Iowa Hawkeyes is snapped. The Hawkeyes remain tied with the Yale golf team of the early... For the first time since 1977, the national championship of wrestling would not be going back to Iowa City. The next day, Gable and his family flew to Hawaii for a family vacation. I was crying the whole time. I mean, that's what another one of these trips that my wife had to straighten me out. What was initially planned as a celebration trip had now turned into a self-imposed intervention led by Gable's wife. It was that first morning we woke up, and that's, I think, when she told me, you ain't, you're ain't, you not going with us. You're staying here. You're working on that team. You know, you're staying here, and we'll see you at lunch, and then you can stay with us in the afternoon. But you need to work because you're a mess. Gable's wife and kids left the hotel room to start the vacation. While Dan was left sitting there, alone with his thoughts, he began to reflect on how we'd let the program spiral out of control. It took that loss, from Gibbons' loss, to really kind of start me analyzing all the program, kind of like I did when I lost to Owings, going back. You know, so I'm going back and I'm, and I'm learning, you know, from 83, 84, 85, I'm looking and... I'm saying, you know, some of these people that did call me or, or maybe I got a bad uh, write-up about the wrestling team or something. You know, they got, they got some, they have a legitimate beef. You know, I, I would never admit that, that before. It took a loss for me to get humbled and really look at what we had going. 
I believe Dan Gable saw that he could be better. That's Tim Johnson, a Hall of Fame broadcaster for Iowa Public Television. I think at that time he's going, I do believe that on and off the map matters. And maybe I didn't believe that as much, but as I'm growing, I believe both matter. Iowa was known as the work hard, play hard team of the 80s. As early as 82, 83, we were losing track of what we built our program on. We, we built our program on some really good, solid attitude. But we were, we were losing that humbleness a little bit that you still always need to be able to go and get better. But Gable ignored the warning signs, even with some of his team leaders. I mean, a guy named Penrith, he wins the, he wins the Nationals in 86. He's only a, a sophomore that year, but he had been arrested five times for intoxication or for, not intoxication, but for like underage drinking or something. There was a leadership vacuum and the cupboards were bare as Iowa had stopped recruiting the blue chips in the years prior due to a belief that Gable could make anyone a national champion. He actually believed that. What it made me realize though is I can't let my team have guys that were like eight, nine, ten guys on the team that are good wrestlers, but there's there's really nobody to follow. You needed somebody like initially a Barry Davis, uh, uh, initially, uh, you know, somebody that everybody looked up, like me when I was at West High or like me when I was at Iowa State. Gable's personal life was also unraveling. After flying home from Hawaii, he was spending more time at the bar and less time with his family. One of my wrestlers actually tipped me off. I, I went out with one of my wrestlers after practice one day and said, you know, you should probably be home. I looked at him. I go, whoa. You know, I'm going home. That conversation, along with the loss in 87, was a turning point for the Iowa coach. I mean, sometimes you got to straighten your life up if you want it to really go as well as it can. And that's the issues with most people. They think they're going to straighten their life up by doing one thing. So it's like me when I look back and I thought we were going to get back on on top of the things after nine, eight straight ch- championships. I didn't, re- I forgot we'd gone for four or five years out of line, you know, and that's why it's going to take us like that. So, you know, it didn't just take me coming home that next night to get my life back in, with my family. It took me coming home every night for a long time before things started coming around. And that's the power of wrestling. It teaches you life lessons for handling adversity. And Gable was no stranger to rebuilding. He had done it before, after the Owens loss to get ready for the Russians, and he was about to do it again. His first step was hitting the recruiting trail to find new leadership for the Iowa room. His travels would take him to a remote town in northwest Iowa, where two twin brothers were making headway in the high school circuits for their intensity and brutality. Tom Brands, one of the twins from Sheldon, Iowa, a small town in northwest Iowa. Take a note of that. There is Brands in on a single, and he does get the takedown. Tom and Terry Brands are the most intense wrestlers to ever put on the Iowa black and gold. All we knew is to fight. We fought with each other our whole life in a healthy way. It was, we, were, we, didn't, we just knew to fight. And that ingredient hasn't left my philosophy. That's Tom Brands. You know, talent is more prevalent than fight. And fight and attitude and accountability is a talent. And for some reason, you know, Terry and I had that. You know, with the Brands brothers, you went up another notch of intensity. Tim Johnson was broadcasting for Iowa Public Television when the Brands hit the college circuit. Let's put it this way. They certainly didn't take a back seat on the mat. It's hard to describe the ferociousness at which the Brands wrestle. Now Tom Brands is dominating Kendall Cross. It's reached that point in this match. He is actually dominating. Don't the Brands boys' intensity remind you a lot of someone that's coaching them in the room? They turn wrestling matches into legal fights. If you have one toe in bounds, you better be fighting. It's true. That's the way wrestling's a man's sport, and that's the way it has to be. They put a pace on guys 
that college wrestling had never seen before that time, and many say hasn't seen since the Although, Brands. Oh, there's another takedown. Four takedowns for Tom Brand. Four takedowns, and his brother had one, two, three, four. They're putting on a takedown. They were the epitome of the Dan Gable, Iowa style of wrestling. Constant wrestling, intensity. They're better wrestlers than, they're a better wrestler than I was at that level in some ways. The Brands boys arrived in Iowa City in the fall of 1987, and were just what Gable needed to jumpstart the new culture at Iowa. There was no problems, you know, you know, off the mat from a standpoint. I mean, I don't think either of them ever touched a, a drop of alcohol. Even with the Brands boys, Gable had a long way to go to get Iowa back on top. When we lost in 87, we didn't really win right away. They'd finished second in 88, and then in 89, the bottom fell out. They took sixth, the worst a Gable coach team would ever finish. It was rock bottom. You really analyze why you were sixth, because we were ranked one of three teams to win going into that tournament. To add insult to injury, Iowa's arch nemesis, Oklahoma State, had won their first title since Gable had taken over as head coach at Iowa. The Iowa rivalry, you know, again, yes, it's a, it's a great rivalry, and it's, it was a bitter rivalry, um, a hatred. Hatred. But a lot of, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> it wasn't even a rivalry as much as it's a hatred. That's Mark Perry. He wrestled for and coached at Oklahoma State during the Gable era. When did it start, you think? Oh, God, I think when Gable started winning, you know, because Oklahoma State was the premier program and had been for 60 years, you know, and then Gable comes along and starts winning national title after national title. Iowa and... has already clinched the team of Iowa has clinched a fifth consecutive national champion. Record 158 points scored by Iowa in the meet. That's an NCAA record. So was their margin of victory. You know, obviously there's a jealousy there, like like in any sport. You know, everybody wants them to lose now. And, you know, it's not so much everybody wants Oklahoma State to get beat. They want Iowa to lose. Oklahoma State and Iowa were bitter rivals simply for the fact that they were two of the best teams in college wrestling. But if we want to see where the hatred started, we have to go back to 1984. That year, Oklahoma State won the duel, but then Iowa won the Nationals once again. A few months later at the Olympic trials, Dan Gable was the Olympic coach, and two wrestlers, one from Iowa and one from Oklahoma State, would wrestle for a spot on the Olympic team in one of the most controversial matches of all time. Yeah, this was the uh, 1984 Olympic trials. That's Rick Tucci. He was the ref for the match in question. We had a number of interesting matches that that weekend, but I I guess I was fortunate to be put out on the mat between two great wrestlers, Randy Lewis and Leroy Smith. Leroy Smith was a cowboy from Oklahoma State, and Randy Lewis was an Iowa guy, one of Gable's guys. He helped start the Iowa dynasty. We're looking at a nervous Randy Lewis from Iowa City, Iowa, wrestled at the University of and so on June 21st, 1984, in Allendale, Michigan, Lewis and Smith wrestled in a best-of-three series with Gable on the sidelines as he was to remain neutral throughout the selection process, given his position as the Olympic coach. Randy Lewis won the series and was moving on to the final day of competition. But after the match, Oklahoma State protested a scoring exchange that happened late in the second bout. After an official review, the protest committee demanded that the match be re-wrestled Randy Lewis was so frazzled by the whole exchange, he was never able to regain his composure, and Leroy Smith won matches, two and three, and was now the Olympian. When that tournament ended and wrapped up, Leroy left. Everyone thought he was the Olympian at that way, right? That was the understanding, leaving that tournament in Michigan in June? Yeah, that's basically everybody's understanding. They didn't know it was what was going to take place after that. The Iowa camp appealed to a federal arbitrator that the match should have never been overturned in the first place. Dan Gable was no longer neutral at this point and was testifying in Randy Lewis's defense. So this this was 
something that set people off too about his involvement in the procedure when he was supposed to be neutral because he is the Olympic coach and shouldn't be sitting in the corner or have any involvement with the Iowa wrestlers during the Olympic trials process. The federal arbitrator ruled that Randy Lewis had been wronged and they re-wrestled match two once again with Randy Lewis winning and making the Olympic team. He went on to win a gold medal, but after the Olympics, USA Wrestling demanded that Dan Gable step down as the head coach and was officially censored and banned from all future coaching positions. This would later be lifted, but at the time, the heat and tension between Oklahoma State and Iowa over this 1984 Olympic trials process was incredible. Which brings us back to 1989. Oklahoma State had just won their first title in the Gable era, while Iowa was reeling from a sixth place finish when they received an unlikely transfer from Long Island, New York. Gable didn't even know who you were, that you were coming. No, no, I just showed up. I literally jumped in my car and showed up. That's Tom Ryan. Today, he's the head coach for the Ohio State wrestling team. But back in the summer of 89, he was just a college kid who worshipped Gable and the Hawks. The deepest part of my soul wanted to wrestle at Iowa. But I didn't win the States my senior year, and not that it would have mattered. But, uh, you know, I never had the chance to go to the University of Iowa. So I went to Syracuse, and I was happy there. That all changed when he went to watch Iowa wrestle during their East Coast tour. So I went to the duel, and I watched uh, Tom Brands wrestle. And he lost that night. I believe he lost to Jimmy Martin. But the fire that he wrestled with, I wanted. You know, that's, that's what I admired the most about the sport. You know, I want people clawing their way to points, right? And he had that. <clears throat> so it kind of, you know, watching the whole team wrestle, it kind of reignited this, this fire in me. And I finished the year at Syracuse, but I had made up my mind um, that I was going to leave. In early June of 1989, Tom Ryan pulled into Iowa City at 4 a.m. A few hours later, he'd walk down the steps at Carver Hawkeye Arena to his first Iowa practice. Coach Gable had no idea who he was. So when I went to the room and I was sitting there, he said, go wrestle these two guys, and they were the Steiners. The Steiners were about the last people you'd want to wrestle on your first practice at Iowa. They were all consumed by wrestling. They worked out three times a day, and they were feared. Here's teammate Tom Brands. They would boil their chicken, <laughs> and, and because that was the most healthy way to eat it or, or whatever. You know, they didn't fry it with, with oil. You know, they boiled it. Um, and, and, you know, they would run when it was 20 below zero. They would run outside. And, um, you know, they were, they were purists for the sport of wrestling. Troy and Terry Steiner were a critical piece of the Iowa rebuild, who we'll focus on later in the show. But for now, they were Tom Ryan's workout partners on that hot, muggy day in June of 1989. So Gable's running this workout, and we're drilling, and these two guys, you would take them down in the drill, you know, just practicing your moves, you're going through your positions, and this thing's going viciously for like an hour. And the thing that hit me was when I took them down, the next one... As soon as I stood up, they were in your face for the next position. And the pace, I, could, I couldn't, my heart was, I couldn't take the pace. But I remember being exhausted at the end of this practice and Gable, at the end of this drill, and Gable saying, time. And I was like, God, oh, thank God. I mean, that was so hard. Yeah. This drill was so hard. And I was like, that was a great practice. And then Gable, I, I, I'll never forget, he said, are you guys warm? It was a warm up. And I was like, holy cow, this is, this is bad. Keep in mind that Tom Ryan was a Division I wrestler. He was in shape. But that's how hard a Dan Gable at Iowa practice was. So then we wrestled for about, it was probably about a 40 minutes of live. And the first five minutes went okay. And the next 35 were a disaster. I mean, I got beat unmercifully by these twins. And it was a crossroad for me. You know, I remember it to this day. It's a crossroad. I got in my car. I remember picking up my stuff. I walked up the stairs of Carver Hawkeye Arena. I went out to the parking lot, got into my car. It was a hot summer day. Car was baking hot. I know I had blood everywhere. I know I, I could barely lift up my head to, to even drive the car because they had pulled on it so much. I had never had people pulling my head so hard. They pulled on my head. I got the key in the ignition. And I didn't, I didn't put it in reverse. And I just started crying. 
I mean, I just was bawling. I'm like, what should I do? That was terrible. Oh my I'm embarrassed. Gable's probably thinking this guy is probably going to leave. I'll probably never see him again. After that workout, Tom Ryan would make a decision that would impact the rest of his life. You know, I made up my mind in the car on the way to the hotel that I was going to fight back. He would soon move in with Terry Brands and immerse himself in the process of getting better. There was just this deepest love for me to want to be great at this sport. Shortly after Tom Ryan arrived, Coach Gable implemented what would be known as the 365-day plan, a Bible, if you will, on how to live your life to become a national champion. So he had it broken up by uh, championship season, uh, preseason, postseason, summer training, and it was just it was just a breakdown of best practices for success in each of these seasons of your life. The 365-day plan was the blueprint for the rebuild, but the real magic, the real key to Gable's success was the trust he developed with his athletes. And part of the reason why I trust him so much is his life was an example of what I, I aspired, right? So, so, so one, he was so incredibly trustworthy from, from in many aspects, but one, the training. If I go there, he's going to train me in a way that I can believe in. The trust allowed Gable to be direct with his guys. He was incredibly honest and truthful, but never got, got personal. Look, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not picking on you. I'm not belittling you. I'm not degrading you. I'm not, I'm not doing any of that. I'm sharing truth with you about the wrestling, right. not about you as a human being, about, about your wrestling. And slowly over time, Coach Gable would take guys who are not great athletes and through force of will, turn them into national champions. At some point in time, the tide changes. And all of a sudden, after half a year or three quarter of a year, you're in that wrestling room and you're not beaten, but you're going even and getting the best of them some days, some pretty dang good guys. And you go from, I got to his leg. I got in on his leg deep. Uh, I actually finished one of 10. And you're looking around, you're going, you know what, I'm pretty good. But you didn't look around and get a big head because somebody would knock it off. There's no better case study of Coach Gable taking a wrestler to a new level than the Allen Freed, Tom Brains rivalry. Allen Freed was one of the best high school wrestlers of all time. He was the first person to win four high school national titles and took down the reigning world champion when he was just a junior in high school. Look at Allen, he's in there. He's in deep. He's got Smith. He's got Smith. Look at this. Wow, what a phenomenal performance we're seeing. A junior in high school against the number one rated wrestler in the world. He was known as the Phenom and dismantled Tom Brands in high school. What do you remember of those battles? I remember getting beat up in high school and... Uh, bad, really bad. I remember they gave me Tom Brands and then Terry Brands back to back and uh, threw a Steiner in there on me too. That's Alan Freed. My match with Tom was was odd because I beat him 17 to 1 in like, I don't know, like 90 seconds. Like most young wrestlers during this time, Freed worshipped Gable. I wanted to be the next Gable. But on signing day... Free decided to be a cowboy and went to Oklahoma State. And by the time he wrestled Brands for the first time in college, the Gable effect was on full display. Oh, it was a lot closer, yeah. No, no, that was a tight match. I think it was 8-6, eight, 8-7 eight, or something. I was, he had me on the ropes at the end, I think. But you were in the ballpark with the guy that, you know, was a phenom. Brands had closed the gap significantly since high school, but Gable expected more from him. And he took to the media to motivate his young star. Gable gave it to me in the newspaper. And Gable was absolutely right. Um, and he never did that. So that was an eye-opener. But the next day, he comes up to me and he said, you know, I think I was probably a little rough on you. And he apologized, but didn't say I apologize. But he apologized. I think I was a little bit rough on you on the, in the newspaper. And it was like a 6-5 to five match, maybe. And, uh, you know, that kind of like, I want you to be rough on me. I don't care. I got, I, I, you were right. Later that season, while Freed was redshirting, Tom Brands won his first national title under Gable. But the celebration was short-lived. Iowa would finish third as a team, and Oklahoma State won their second consecutive title. 
A few weeks later at the team banquet, Tom Brands was reminded that he was still winless against Alan Freed. Yeah, one of the seniors got up and was a um, he was a non-starter, but he, his seniors got the mic at the at the banquet at the end of the year, and he said, um, "And Tom Brands would like to thank Alan Freed for taking a red shirt so he could win a national title this year," and that really pissed me off. It's safe to say that Tom Brands had all the motivation he needed heading into the 1991 season, as did Gable. It had been four years since he had won a team championship, while Oklahoma State had won the past two. But Gable had ammunition coming off the bench. Tom Ryan was finally eligible to compete, and he had won a scholarship the previous winter after beating defending national champ Pat Smith from Oklahoma State. It was a moment that he would never forget. So he brought me in his office, and it was it was one of the single like most fulfilling moments of my life when I reflect back, right? <laughs> uh, he said, nice job. Uh, we've got some, some scholarship money uh, left here, and I'm going I'm to give it to you for the second semester. And he said, we got 300 bucks. It could have been $3 or $30 million. To Tom Ryan, it didn't matter. He was living out his childhood dream. The rest of the lineup was also taking shape, as Iowa would field one of the best starting groups of all time, led by two sets of twins, the Brands, and the Steiners. And the two Steiner boys, besides the two brand boys, were the reason why we were able to get back on top again. Because that put 40, that put four out of 10 weight classes of guys that were into the sport unbelievably. And so we had that attitude back. Here's Tommy Brands on the Steiner impact. We complemented each other very good in a lot more ways than just um, being workout partners or peers on the team. Um, it was a one, two, three, four punch and then throws Apatow in there at 118. And so it was a one, two, three, four, five punch. Iowa's star-studded lineup didn't stop there. You know, you got Ryland after that, and then you got Chelsvig, and then you got Pfizer, and then you got Ozendorf, and then you got an All-American, Doug Stryker, who didn't make the team after his sophomore year because Terry Steiner beat him out. So you had a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven punch. Gable had fielded great teams in the past, but this one felt different. Most of the guys didn't drink, and they were all consumed by a single goal. I think that was one thing with that team that we had that during those years is you had really had 10 individuals, and there were more than 10, but probably 15 or 20 in that room that really had a, they had one goal in mind. That's Troy Steiner. You know, and that was to win a national championship as an individual and as a team. And, and not only that, just to be the best you could be. The 91 season was an absolute rout for the Hawks. At the Big Tens, they had nine finalists, six champs, and one third. It was Gable's 15th consecutive Big Ten crown. Next up was the Nationals. Welcome back to the campus of the University of Iowa and the 1991 NCAA Wrestling Championship. Over 70,000 fans poured into Carver Hawke that weekend to watch one of the great performances in wrestling history. Iowa dominated and it wrapped up the team title by Friday night. All that was left was to see how many champs they'd crown and if they could break the all-time record. Meanwhile, Okie State had finished second, but had two finalists that were looking to spoil Iowa's party. One of them was Alan Freed, who was squaring off against an old friend, Tom Brands. Freed lets Brands go. That knocks the score 2-2. Two to two. Brands will want to play this takedown game. The same with Freed. They both have that same style of wrestling, and Brands lost an excellent opportunity to score there, not being able to hold on to Alan Freed. Just a few years prior, Freed did tech Brands in 90 seconds, and now Tom was in the finals as the defending national champ undefeated. He gives all the credit to Gable. Like I said, I mean, we got better because of his genius, and I don't know what that genius was. We meshed. And it was, a, it was an explosion of great ingredients that when they came together, and it took time. And Brands took advantage of a poor Alan Freed shot and followed it up with one of his own. And there, a nice finish to get the takedown. He now leads it 4-2. to two. Brands would win the match, and after Troy Steiner finished second, Tom Ryan was up. Ryan faced Pat Smith, the number one seed and defending champ from Oklahoma State. Pat Smith, the brother of Leroy Smith, whom Gable had had so much controversy with back in 84. 
it was also the same Pat Smith who Ryan had previously beat to earn a scholarship. Here's Mark Perry again. Pat Smith's uncle, who was in the arena that night. Tom was a Tom was a great competitor. You know, again, uh, an Iowa type kid, wasn't a great athlete, wasn't a great wrestler, skill wise compared to Pat. But he was just such a great competitor. When Tom Ryan arrived at Iowa, he was never an All-American. But under two years with Gable, he found himself in the national finals. You know, obviously that was Iowa, though. That was that was Gable. What he what he could get out of his athletes, he would get them to compete and battle. And um, he did it with several athletes. The Iowa fans are going crazy that night as Tom Ryan jumped out to an early lead. A shot there countered well by Ryan. And you can hear this crowd encouraging Ryan as he tries to spin behind Smith. He's got him close to the edge, and that'll count. <laughs> the crowd was calling for the two points. The match was going to plan for Gable and Tom Ryan. I was incredibly confident I was going to win. I really believe with every ounce of me that the, that the training that I had uh, I, w I was so confident yeah. in the training. It really seems that this match will come down to a takedown game. He's going to get it. Escape for Ryan, and he takes the lead, 6-5. to five. While Gable was personally invested in all of his athletes, this one seemed different. That was the hardest match I ever coached. Looks like Gable wants to get out there and uh, help Ryan. Gable looks like he's ready for the coronary unit. The match came down to the wire. With 50 seconds left, Ryan was up by a point, when he and Pat Smith scrambled out of bounds. So I remember going out of bounds. And I remember looking at the score. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm up by one. I look at the score and I look at the time. And I remember my mind going to, I'm going to win. I mean, my dreams, I mean, everything I wanted, I'm going to win this thing. He's not scoring on me. So that, that, that mindset happens from the edge of the mat until I walk into the center. He goes out of bounds with me. He looks at the clock. And his mind saying, I'm gonna, well, I got one more shot. I'm scoring. When it gets down to crunch time, you want to go back to what works best for you. And Smith is in on that low single. He's got Ryan down. That should be a takedown right there. That should put him up 7-6. to six. And Ryan now must get away or he will lose this match. Tom Ryan was unable to get away and lost the match. Pat Smith would go on to become the first four-time champ in NCAA history. It was a bittersweet moment for Coach Gable. He had won the team title, but the Tom Ryan loss weighed heavy on his mind. Well, anytime uh, you can capture something that uh, slipped away from you for a few years, it's, it's great. You know, No matter what kind of performance we had, it's, it's a team championship. It's a great effort. We had eight guys in the top three. But, you know, sure, we, coming in these finals, we were favored in only two of the six. We ended up getting only two of the six. The University of Iowa with two national champions, four runners up, and three third-place wrestlers score a near-record 157 points to win the national title. Defending champions, Oklahoma State. With What's most impressive about the rebuild was how Gable did it. He did it with the right culture and with the right guys. Now the only question was, how long could he sustain it for? In 10 seconds... We'll wish you a little early. Happy New Year. Thanks ever so much for making the part of your party. It is now 1992. Happy New Year! 1992 saw Gable and the Hawks claim their second consecutive title, beating Oklahoma State by over 50 points. Recruiting efforts were also paying off, as Gable landed one of the most sought-after high school prospects since Alan Freed. McElravey, one of the best young high school prospects ever to come into college at ranks. McElravey, a winner of 200 matches in high school. In four years of high school, he won five state titles. That's because he won one in eighth grade. Lincoln McElravey was a blue chipper from South Dakota. And since the Steiner twins were also from the Dakotas, Iowa had an early lead in the recruiting process. Gable pounced on the situation and paid Lincoln a visit. I, I've said this a handful of times, and I, I think it's true, like, Anybody that knows Coach Gable feels like they have a special relationship with Coach Gable. And how could he have that many close relationships? I don't, you know, that's part of his genius. Gable needed Lincoln. Iowa had graduated six starters from the previous year, including the Brands Twins and Tom Ryan. Plus, Penn State was new to the Big Ten and was a legit threat for a national title. 
Even the Iowa faithful had their doubts as to if Gable could pull off the three-peat. Here is Troy Steiner, who by this point was team captain and a senior. And after one of the practices that we had as a team, there was a guy in a wheelchair that was watching practice. And I was kind of walking out with him, talking with him. And he said, how do you think you guys are going to do this here? And I'm like, I think we're going to be all right. And he just he said, ah, you're never going to do it. You lost too much. And we were sitting at the corner, ready to cross the street. And I got, I was so mad. Like, I wanted to push him out in front of the cars. The naysayers proved to be right as the Hawks got off to a historically slow start. The scene has changed. There's a whole new look at the top with Penn State ranked number one. That's the first time in two years that any team other than the Hawkeyes have been number one. And with Nebraska, number two, perhaps the highest they've ever been ranked. I think there's a little changing of the guard, Doug. As the season progressed, the situation was becoming more dire for Gable. He had serious holes in his lineup and had changed the starting rotation several times throughout the year. Tell you what, Dan Gable might say the same thing because here we are, the middle of February. For the first time, he's unsure about four weights. Gable had to act, and he started toying with the idea of pulling Lincoln's redshirt. There was only three weeks left in the dual meet season. He's a true freshman. Yeah, he's a true freshman. And uh, all of a sudden, Penn State's coming into the Big Ten for the first year. So you got you don't know if you think about all those things. And uh, we got a string going, and Penn State's had beaten us. It was a risky move to pull a redshirt this late into the season. I had to figure out how to make a better team and not just throw somebody in the lineup that was not proven except for back in high school. Another issue was finding a place for Lincoln in the lineup. It would mean that Troy Steiner, the defending national champ at 142 pounds, would have to cut to 134. So Gable approached Troy with the idea. When I went and talked to Troy Steiner, he goes, you know, I've already been thinking about going down a weight so we can get Lincoln in the lineup to help this team to win because, you know, Penn State's coming in and and uh, we want to keep this string going. It was like I was already thinking about it but and I was getting ready to go to Steiner, but he had, he'd already beat me to the punch. So all of a sudden, Troy Steiner's telling me what I want to ask him before I even ask him. Gable then approached McElravey. Said, hey, what do you think about competing this year? And I said, I think that'd be great. And I'd lived, I was living with Terry and Troy Steiner, and they, they trained three times a day, every single day. So I just thought that was the thing to do. So I just trained with those guys. And so even though I hadn't been competing much as a red shirt, I was, I was ready. You know, I would, had been following those guys around. Now it was up to Troy Steiner to make the brutal cut down to 134 pounds. So I went to the All-Star meet on February 1st, and that was on a Monday. And Friday, we wrestled Northwestern. Troy wrestled 142 pounds at the All-Star meet and got back to Iowa City Tuesday morning. I think I came back at weight like 152. And uh, and then that, that week I was down on, on Friday, I made 134. It was a massive sacrifice for Troy, one that he hoped would save Iowa's season and secure a third straight national title. On February 5th, 1993, Lincoln wrestled his first match as an Iowa starter. They brought Troy Steiner, national champion of 142, down to 134, and you can bet they plan on him winning a title there. And at 142, they brought Lincoln McElravey, a freshman, into the lineup. Carver Hawkeye is the mecca of wrestling, but it can be intimidating. Yeah, I was thinking that there's this invincibility now that I'm an Iowa wrestler because you watch Iowa wrestling on Iowa public TV and all the dominating performances. And I aspired to that. So I thought, well, this is, here's my chance, but it just didn't happen. And uh, McElroy is a little bit scattered here. Lincoln's first varsity match as an Iowa wrestler ended in a loss. Yeah, but you got to realize he, idolized Carver Hawkeye Arena and he had never wrestled in there. The pressure, I didn't really think about it. And he gassed himself. I mean, I handpicked the match for him to come out. So when we decided when he was going to come out, I said Northwestern's the match because that guy he can tech fall. He can, you know, he can beat him by eight or so. And he loses by seven or eight. He might have got majored because he fell apart. And I didn't take into account 
all the pressure from his family, which I didn't realize, and the fact that his dad didn't want him to do it. Ken McElravey was against the plan from the start and was waiting for Gable at the after party. He was waiting for me to walk through the door to attack me. So I went around the back of the building, went in, came in from behind him, and grabbed him right from behind. Him. And I said, Ken, he turned and go, and I started talking real fast. I said, I'm here. We got to talk. And I'm saying, we got to do things. We got to work things together because you know what? He's committed. He cannot not wrestle now. And so me and you, the only way he's going to come back is if me and you get together and figure out how we're going to help this kid because there's no option now. He's already burned the red shirt. He was ready to only just call me every name in the book. And by the time I got done saying that, he was like, uh, 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 yeah, you're right. But he was ready to rip me and he, you know, and I don't care, but I had to approach him first, not let him start the conversation, and I had to control it because there was no other choice. And if he even started going the other way, we're wasting time to win the national tournament. So the bottom line is I had to come up with a plan, and, and that plan was the one that started right away in Carver. What unfolded is a prime example of Coach Gable doing anything he could to get his guys ready. So you, to get Lincoln's confidence back up, you design three mock dual meets mm-hmm. at Carver. Mm-hmm. Bring in a real, real audience? Or a fake real fake? audience. 2,000 people from local Iowa City, Cedar Rapids came, and we set them right, all right close to the mat, right on the Carver Hawkeye Arena. See, what happened, I'm thinking, you know, Carver Hawkeye Arena made this guy somebody that he's not really. He fell apart right away, and it's got to be this arena. So we got to do something in this arena to make sure he has more experience. With only two weeks left in the season, Gable resorted to holding mock tryouts a few days after the Northwestern loss to get Lincoln more experience in the Iowa singlet. You know, I think he maybe sensed that I was a little intimidated or just not used to the types of crowds in that environment. As genius as the plan was, Lincoln was reeling from a loss, and the thought of having a wrestle-off was less than exciting. And so I'd come out of red shirt, and now my red shirt's over, and and now I've got these wrestle-offs. And I went and talked to Coach Gable about that, and I said, I'm not going to lose, but what if I lose? I said, you're not going to lose. I said, I agree, but what if I did? Little did Lincoln know that Gable had instructed the Iowa backups to throw the matches. The kids that actually wrestled him told me that they knew they couldn't win, and that may have been something. But just by chance, if they were, they weren't going to. They had to lose. (laughs) But he doesn't believe that to this day. And herein lies the genius of Dan Gable. His ability to understand what his athletes needed was unparalleled in college wrestling. You know, who would have thought to do that? I've never heard of that before or since then. And And it was the right recipe. And a lot of times with Gable... Even if it was the wrong recipe, because it's Gable, it's now the right recipe. The plan worked. Lincoln won the wrestle-offs as well as the second varsity match. And his presence in the lineup sparked a new enthusiasm amongst the Iowa team. Isn't, it looks like McElroy, he's really made for this Iowa Dan Gable style, isn't he? Well, like I said, he likes to come at you. He likes to put a lot of pressure on you. And yeah, he's made for the Iowa style. At the Big Tens, Iowa won by the slimmest of margins. Four and a half points over Penn State. Dan Gable was now 17 for 17 at the Big Ten Tournament. Heading into the Nationals, Lincoln rode the momentum all the way to the NCAA Finals. Gable's decision to pull the red shirt was looking like the move of the century as Iowa was nearing closer to a third straight team title. A few hours before the Finals, he addressed his guys at the Iowa hotel room. 42. He's going to want to get in control of the match. He likes to get on in a cling and crab ride and things like that. I don't think he likes wrestling seven minutes straight. The main thing is what I said. Do what you normally do. Do what you normally do. One wrestler absent from the finals was returning champ Troy Steiner. He was beat in the semis and had to settle for third. It's hard to imagine that the cut down to 134 didn't somehow impact his performance. I don't, I don't blame it on on me moving down a weight. I 
I, I don't think it was physical. I think I had my weight under control at that point or as much as I could. And, and uh, I think it was, I was just in the mind, my mindset wasn't right. I wanted it to be over with instead of in really, it should have been the best time in my career really as a senior going into your semifinal match and, you know, looking forward to getting out there and wrestling. I just wanted to be over with. Gable would say that Troy Steiner gave up a sure thing by moving from 142 to 134, all to help the Hawks' chances of a three-peat. Now it was up to Lincoln to make it happen in the finals. But man, it did not start well. Jerry Abbas from Fresno State took McElravey down several times in the first period. Oh, oh, a beautiful ankle pick by Abbas. He has McElravey in trouble and scores the takedown. And with those two points, that makes the score 12-8, Abbas. Down 12-8 in the third period is a tall order, especially for a true freshman. But McElravey looked to his coaches, who were still cheering him on, and started to string together one takedown after another, and started to chip away at the Abbas lead. Moving down now to the final minute of this match. McElravey in on a nice single. Abbas doing his best to counter, but McElravey's got good position. He should score. And there's the takedown. That gives the lead 12-11, Abbas. Like we've seen so many times before, the national championship came down to the final seconds of the match. The referees, Gable saying, take that man down. Abbas is 20 seconds away from the title. McElravey needs to stay aggressive, needs to continue attack Abbas. Oh, a stall call against Abbas. That's a penalty point for McElravey, and a takedown now will win it. McElravey gets a duck under the takedown. Oh, what a comeback. It's over, and Lincoln McElravey becomes only the second true freshman to win a title in the NCAA championships. His here. How important is Dan Gable, a legend at grinding down opponents and coming back, mean to you? He's the ultimate, man, because I looked over there, and I was down by a lot, and he still believed in me. He was still saying, get in there and get a takedown, get another one, get another one. Led by three third-place finishes and a couple champs, Iowa completed the three-peat. I can promise you that it wouldn't have happened had Gable not pulled McElroy's red shirt and shuffled the Steiners. You know, you know, looking back, it, obviously, it, for the most part, it worked out, right? I mean, my Lincoln won a title, my brother won a title, the team won the title. Gable would win three more championships before retiring in 1997. The Hawkeye faithful thanked their coach by erecting a bronze statue outside of Carver Hawkeye, right near the wrestler's entrance. The place where Gable had spent so many hours creating one of the great dynasties of all time. There aren't many people, and uh, Dan's the only one in my lifetime that I've met, there aren't many people who can say they were the best in the world at what they did. Dan Gable can say that, and we're going to have an opportunity for the rest of time to display uh, and for all the world to see this larger than... When Gable took the podium to speak, he felt the presence of his sister, just like he had 40 years earlier when he won the Olympic gold medal. And But for those that are strong in faith... This is my family right here. And what's unbelievable, there's some empty chairs there, but if you want to take a picture of this family right here, if you take it, when that picture is developed, those empty seats right there are gonna be filled with my mom, my dad, and my sister. They're gonna be there, and that, I'm telling you, if you want to take it, they're gonna show up. They're there. I see them right now. The ceremony kicked off the 2012 Olympic trials, but 10 months later, wrestling received a death blow from the International Olympic Committee. New this morning, the Associated Press reports that the International Olympic Committee will drop wrestling from the 20. It's decided Olympics. to eliminate an event whose roots reach back to ancient times. The Beginning in 2020, will be announced shortly wrestling. at the IOC Executive Board meeting in Lausanne in Switzerland. Under a self-imposed mandate to remove an Olympic sport for the 2020 Games, the IOC opted to cut wrestling over the modern pentathlon. There was international outrage. Gable was at his compound in Iowa City when he heard the news. How, how personal is this to you? Personal? If I didn't know you right now, yeah. I know you know me, and that's why you're asking me. If I start thinking about my grandkid, if I turn a little country music on, these tears would be flowing. But. Instead of tears right now, 
I'm determined. I'm not going to break. Gable would spend the next couple of months doing press and flying across the country as wrestling prepared its case as to why it should remain an Olympic sport. From Iran to Russia to Bulgaria, there's got to be international outrage. <laughs> Dan, if there's going to be traction, it's going to be through you. What is the plan to get it back? Because September, they have a chance to correct their wrong. Well, we want to win that vote. Uh, In September of 2013, the IOC took a final vote to decide the fate of Olympic wrestling. With 49 votes, wrestling has been elected for the 2020 Were it not for the efforts of Gable, Mike Novogratz, and so many others, 2020 would have been the first Olympics without wrestling. Today, wrestling has never been in a better place. Online viewership and in-person attendance were at record highs for 2020. Thanks to women's wrestling, the Big Ten Network, Flow, and MMA, more and more people are getting exposed to the benefits of amateur wrestling. As we wind down, I'll leave you with one final quote from Tommy Brands. Go Gable, go Hawks. Next time on the Wrestling Changed My Life documentary series. When we walked down like the tunnel at Assembly Hall, in the one year we had four state champs, it was like we had our own music. We had a walkout crowd. I mean, it was like we literally were walking out Roy Jones. We're here with the newly crowned Oak Park River Force head coach, Mike Powell. Everybody move out Mike of the way. Powell. Isaiah White's coming through the hall. Like the champ is here. It's a fantastic team here. I don't I mean, know that I'll ever be well, part of a, a, pro, a, a team that'll be better than this. He was a champion wrestler at Oak Park and River Forest High School. He came back to the school as head wrestling coach and turned a struggling team into a statewide powerhouse. But now, He's personally facing the match of his life. I got really, really sick in 2009. Long story short, and, uh, I lost a little over 40 pounds of muscle. I have a muscle wasting disease, muscle weakening disease. Again, I, it's called yeah. a bunch of different things, called polymyositis. Let me introduce our uh, keynote speaker here. Mike is a high school wrestling coach in suburban Chicago. I basically went from, you know, I woke up, we won the state championship. I looked at my wife, my now wife, who's my fiance at the time, and I said, I, I don't know that my life could get any better than this. His uh, school team has won two state championships. It was all built around, you're, you're unique. You have done things that are unique. You are preparing to take that belief that you had in what we've done in our system and the way we work, and the way we warm up, and everything we do is just slightly better than everybody else. And, you know, into now I'm going to put it forth in the arena and I am the man and I deserve to be the man because I've earned this spot in the arena and this is glorious. Coming in the spring of 2020, a story about the 2014 Oak Park River Forest Huskies, one of the best teams to ever come out of Illinois, and their coach, Mike Powell. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for listening. It was a real honor to produce this documentary and I can't wait to bring you more. If you want to support the show, please text MERCHANDISE to 555-888. That's MERCHANDISE to 555-888, and we'll send you a link to our online store. If you want to hear more from the show, please go to WrestlingChangeMyLife.com. That's WrestlingChangeMyLife.com. That's it, folks. We're signing off. Take care. 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 We're signing off. Take care.